You are listening to a universe of possibilities. This is Astronomy FM. Coming up next, an Astronomy.fm original program. It's time for York Universe, a co-production of the Observatory of York University, Toronto, and the Voice of Astronomy. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. AFM Radio. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and good friends, such as myself, of York University. I'll be one of your hosts this evening. My name is Ryan, and I'm joined by our other host, Elena. Hello, Elena. Hello, hello. It's wonderful to be here. And glad to have you on here. Uh, we are broadcasting live from the Alan I. Carswell Observatory, located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. This is also Science Night in Canada, where the lineup is all Canadian. We start with ourselves, York Universe, and then on to Western Worlds, Quirks and Quarks, and Science for the People. York Universe broadcasts every Monday night at 9 p.m. local Toronto time or Tuesday morning at 2 a.m. UT. The York Universe production works in concert with our online public viewing program run by the observatory team, which runs between the hours of 9 and 10 p.m. local Toronto time. Now, you're actually going to want to go on to observatory.info.yorku.ca, follow the links to the online public viewing, and join the chat because it is a beautiful, clear evening here in Toronto. And uh, the, the, the telescope is running, the cameras are up. We're, we're excited to see what the observatory team uh, shows us tonight. So our broadcast is powered by and in partnership with astronomy.fm, the voice of astronomy. For any questions or comments you have of our past shows, or if you have any suggestions for future topics, send us an email, observe at yorku.ca. And of course, we're gonna be monitoring the chat room for questions to post new content, um, and uh, finally, you can always connect with us on good old Twitter, our handle at York Observatory, uh, or Instagram at York U Observatory, and finally, Facebook at Alan I. Carswell OBS. And of course, all of our programs are free, but if you want to make a donation, see our website. Uh, you can follow the links there observatory.info.yorku.ca. Elena, we have lots of astronomy to talk about this evening. <laughs> So much astronomy. It is absolutely amazing. This has been a mind-bogglingly astronomical amount of things happening, uh, things changing, things being visible. And uh, thank you so much for giving the social media crew a shout out. I'll just give an extra welcome. Our, we do have an all new social media crew at York uh, Observatory coming on this fall. So a big welcome to everybody who is posting for the first time. Um, most of them are actually also hosting over in chat on YouTube right now. So you can wander on over and say hello. Now you mentioned the uh, imaging. We are hoping to show live images from the one meter telescope on OPV, which if you've been following along is a little bit of an unusual thing. We actually haven't been able to do that for uh, about a month due to some construction and earlier this evening we were viewing actually the wild duck cluster so if you are interested to see what's up right now um, you can head on over to YouTube and they will be switching on live imaging as it becomes available from the telescope exciting times and, yeah, of and course, hello to the new team then I, I yes good very to exciting. hopefully it's it's well it's good to imagine you for the first time you're hearing me right now but We'll, uh, we'll have to check out what they're posting and uh, what they're chatting about in the next little bit. Exactly. And they, they are a wonderful, active team uh, just getting started. Very excited about astronomy, which is always wonderful, uh, wonderful to share with everyone. Um, now, as for other things that are exciting... <laughs> I suppose I should give myself a little bit of a segue um, so we can get to a, a bit of this week in space astronomy history. Yeah, I mean, it's all I can help you with the segue. It's 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 September. Everybody gets back into the swing of school and, and education. Everybody's coming back from their summer vacations. Um, unfortunately, we have a bit of a tragedy to talk about today. Well, and it's um, I mean, part tragedy is a bit of sadness uh we we do have to start off this week in space and astronomy history with a little bit of remembrance um so i am actually going to start off our first uh item tonight 
with remembering Valery Polyakov, who took the longest single trip to space. Um, so he was a uh, very famous astronaut, and his record of 437 days in space began on January 8th, 1994. Now, he did pass away uh, basically today um, at the age of 80. So he, he was um, a respectably aged uh, person. Um, I, and his cause of death is not uh, stated, so presumably old age. Uh, but he does still hold the record for the longest single stay in space. Um, so this was announced by Roscosmos. He ha actually had multiple stays in space. Um, he was he did have the record, as I say, in 1994, and. Um, uh, above, and this was actually using the space station Muir. Um, so Muir is no longer in orbit. It was deorbited some time ago. But while aboard Muir, he orbited Earth more than 7,000 times. And he started in 1994, came back in 1995. He was uh, somewhat of a character <laughs> and deserves, deserve, definitely deserves a special shout out. Uh, when he landed, he actually declined to be carried out. Uh, despite having spent all this time in no gravity, uh, you lose a lot of muscle structure. Um, weightless environments affect your bone density, affect your muscles. You can't be expected to immediately be able to jump out and do somersaults. But he said, no, no, I want to get out myself. And he was helped to climb out himself. So he did climb out himself and he walked to a nearby transport vehicle. And this doesn't sound like an incredible achievement, but let me assure you that after a year of, uh, over a year of being in space, um, this is quite the uh, quite the thing. He actually had trained as a physician and he wanted to demonstrate that the human body could endure extended periods in space. So he was a, a bit of a space fan. He wanted to show that it was possible for humans to, to really live there and that we we would be able to survive he uh before this long stay he had previously spent another 288 days in space in 1988 to 89 uh, so he was a big space fan and um this was of course uh a lot of his his space records are from earlier times but it's worth remembering now as we're sort of entering this really interesting new uh, space age with things like, of course, Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and all these private companies and NASA trying with Artemis. Um, before all of this happened, we have a lot of interesting space history. And if it wasn't for uh, um, people like Valeri, we wouldn't know as much as we do about how the human body responds in weightless environments. And so the medical training and the medical um, uh, regimes they prescribe for astronauts now in terms of exercise, a lot of those were based off of, uh, you know, things like his stay and, of course, studies about how muscles are are affected. Um, it's uh, um, in particular as a shout out for this mission one of the things that he was hoping to show back in uh, um, uh, 1995, if I remember to get my dates right, one of the things he was hoping to show was that humans could be physically capable of working on the surface of Mars after a long duration transit phase, which is really interesting because, of course, you have things like the case for Mars by Robert Zubrin and um, a lot of science and science fiction theories about how to how to get to Mars, how to set up bases on Mars. And if you were to take sort of the fastest feasible path, most people would agree it would be at least six months of space travel. And so the fact that he was able to respond so well after so long in space did actually give some very good evidence that uh, at least if you were as fit as he was, you would actually be capable of physically working on the surface of Mars if you had taken even a longer transit to get there. Um, and now this record that he had uh, from his second space flight, the 437 days, uh, was later broken by Sergei 
uh, and Endiev and was currently held by Gennady Padalka. And of course, as we get more and more people in space, perhaps some of those space hotels will uh, materialize. This record could still be broken in the uh, mm-hmm. in the future. I have now, to think that um, that Polyakov was was thinking a lot about Mars when he was was flying around in in Mir, and thinking about it, you know as a doctor understanding uh, a little bit deeper the effects of space flight on the body. You know, this is this is a, a big thing for him to do that. And, you know, in, in yes. vision problems too. One thing not to um, add is that, you know, of course, males have uh, vision issues spending a long time a long time in space, but not, but only, only men, not women, which is kind of interesting as well. So he would have had. Not have all of the amenities that the current International Space Station uh, boasts. The Mir Space Station was also low Earth orbit. Of course, it uh, was deorbited is a nice way to put it in 2001. Um, uh, but it did not have, of course, the espresso maker and the um, advanced exercise equipment that we have seen in, of course, modern um, space station uh, layouts. <laughs> <laughs> well, we needed we needed Sam Cristoforetti to go to space and an Italian yes. to get the the uh, yes. proper espresso. Well, uh, we we just needed her <laughs> in space all along. Uh, but um, excellent, excellent astronaut. Highly, highly recommended follow if you are if you are on uh, on social media. Um, but yes, the uh, it is it is was a very very constrained environment. The mere air quality did not have. To my knowledge, a particularly good reputation, <laughs> um, but this would have been a really extreme environment to um, to be in for that that long. And of course, the um, it, additional radiation exposure was another thing that they were monitoring. Yeah. And because he was a medical doctor, as you say, um, he he actually published quite a lot on different effects um, and actually. Uh, was later actually helping to select um, uh, cosmonauts for the program. So uh, really interesting person and uh, uh, will be missed. Yeah, what a, what a perfect person to help select future cosmonauts. Not only a physician, uh, not only an astronaut, but somebody who had spent a long time in, in those uh, intense environments on Mir. So yeah, we remember you. Valery Polyakov. Uh, we're we're going to move on to uh, quite a bit earlier before uh, Valery went on his his space flights. Uh, for our next item in this week in, in astronomy history, we're going to go to 1961 because today in 1961 was the date that that Houston, Texas, was chosen as the site for the crewed space flight center, which eventually was flight center in 1973. But it's kind of an interesting story because you know when you start with the space race, <coughs> excuse me. And NASA has so much more funding. They started out um, with the Gemini program and what was called the STG, the Space Task Group, which was originally housed at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, And the the Canadians spin on this, because we have to do a little bit of that, being a a Canadian institution, 32 Canadian engineers from the Avro Aero Project actually joined NASA's Space Task Group. Uh, And that made the team too large to actually be housed at Goddard in Washington or Langley, Virginia. Oh, so Ryan, the, yeah. uh, just to oh. just to interrupt you a tiny bit, we do have some breaking astronomy news. Oh, that wild duck cluster that I promised everyone before is live right now. Um, so Houston, we have a duck cluster. Um, and that's how I'll get you back to your item. <laughs> well, it, yeah, duck in case you uh, in case you get hit, you should go and see that. It's a, you know, uh, yeah, I love, York, I love York University Allen I Carswell Observatory YouTube. Um, so they are showing some images to go along with our audio tonight, and um, uh, we aren't talking about ducks, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't know, just live images are wonderful. I'm I'm always a fan of of um, seeing some new observations. A lot of my my, my close friends are um, uh, avid observers, so it's uh, I, I do a little bit less of that with a toddler now, but it's still nice to see what they uh, what they produce. And so an actual uh, proper high quality research grade telescope, um, such as the one meter, 
must produce some beautiful images. So I gotta gotta make sure we check that out, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely, and uh, and of course, um, you know, not not of uh, the uh, um, uh, NASA also has telescopes that are not to be sneezed at, but. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. So, uh, so I mean, going back to the the kind of the human spaceflight uh, story, we're, what we're talking about the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. So, uh, so we got to the point where you know this this team of of engineers was and, and support staff was too large to be housed in one of the main space facilities that they had at the time back in 1960. And so, uh, the administrator of NASA, the first administrator of NASA. Uh, Keith Glennon wrote a memo to his eventual successor, who would be James Webb, that they'd need a new site to house all of these people to work on the human crewed spaceflight aspect, which is you know kind of important when you want to send people out to the moon. Uh, and so in 1962, NASA was given a much bigger budget and they included $60 million for a new human spaceflight center. And I, I, I was really interested in reading through the guidelines that they, they needed in order to build the center. And so uh, if anybody knows Houston well, or if anybody's listening from from Houston or knows the Johnson Space Flight Center really well, listen to these guidelines and see if it, it resonates at all. They need this this site would need access to water transport by large barges, a moderate climate, availability of all weather commercial jet service, a well established established industry and industrial complex, close close proximity to a culturally attractive community with some higher education, so a couple of universities strong electric and water supply and over a thousand acres of land well that sounds like houston uh some of the other sites that they were looking at were in florida of course right because you've got um lots of space flight happened in florida so jacksonville and tampa and florida were potential selections baton rouge and shreveport in louisiana also on the coast uh corpus christi and victoria in texas and in california they were looking at san diego and san francisco um, but so it was It was really interesting. They, they did end up choosing today, 1961, the uh, Houston as the, as the center. And I wanted to go back to JFK's speech at Rice University, his famous speech from 1962. He actually did mention the selection of Houston and the opening of the center. And so here's a quote from JFK. What was once the furthest outpost on the old frontier of the West will be the furthest outpost on the new frontier of science and space, Houston with its manned spacecraft center, crewed space flight center, will become the heart of a large scientific and engineering community. During the next five years, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration expects to double the number of scientists and engineers in the area to increase its outlays for salaries and expenses to 60 million a year, to invest some $200 million in plant and laboratory facilities, and to direct or contract for new space efforts for over a billion dollars from the center in this city. And the rest is history. We have Johnson Space Flight Center where astronauts go to be trained from all over the world. Pretty cool. Very cool. Of course, I guess they, if they were considering um, Florida, uh, lack of alligators was not on the list. No, I suppose not. Uh, I, I would be, I, I mean, maybe I don't know Florida that well, but I don't know if they would find the thousand acres of land just just kind of sitting there. I think most of Florida is owned by Disney at this point, isn't that right? I don't know. I do know that it, there is <laughs> no way you would find that in San Francisco, right? Yes. Like San Francisco, my gosh. <laughs> there you go. It's, I would say uh, the moderate climate would be nice in San Diego, but you know, I think they 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 found the right choice eventually, and uh, you know, it's iconic today. Absolutely, and and it's uh, it is. A very nice location. I, I I've only ever been to the airport uh, myself, but um, I I do know that that it is a, a massive amount of resources in that area, and especially um, the access po to water transport is known to be very very good. So perhaps a reason to go and, and visit Houston sometime. Well, there you go. Apparently, you know, there was a, a, um, a planetarium conference there not that long ago, and I saw some some nice photos of uh, of the Saturn V that they have there and just, just, you know, how immense it is, which it doesn't do it justice in photos, but there there's a reason enough to go and visit. It's just to go and see a, a Saturn V. 
Absolutely. That is an awesome reason. And, you know, we were talking earlier about our, our live imaging from our telescope. If you did want to make, say, one meter telescope at your campus even better, putting it in space would do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and for that, you would need uh, giant rockets. So, um, of course, that's one of the reasons why the JWST or the, you know, just wonderful space telescope is providing mm -hmm. all of these amazing images right now is because of course it is it is in space um all right so shall we continue with some more fun space uh some fun space facts i suppose some in space things right yes i do have an in space thing and i i am i am cheating a little bit um so today <laughs> Um, I think this is probably going to be a very important uh, moment in history. So speaking of launching rockets and spaceflight and the history of spaceflight, uh, one thing I think, you know, we don't often talk about quite enough on um, uh, Canadian uh, astronomy shows is, of course, uh, the Chinese space program. And just today, there was a spacewalk. Um, the Chinese astronauts actually went on a spacewalk from their new space station. And this is, in case you uh, were not aware of it, um, the, the Chinese space station is a modular space station that has been in construction for a while. Um, fully crewed, it's three to six. And I believe, Ryan, you said you have a how many people are in space website? Oh, it's like one of my favorite websites to look at if I'm ever curious. It's literally how many people are in space right now dot com. And sure enough, it does show three uh, Chinese taikonauts who are in space and at, at 339 days and counting. 339 days. That is excellent. Um, yes, yeah, so there are three uh, Taikonauts currently aboard. Uh, fully crewed would be three to six, so they do have um, a fully a full crew at the moment. Once they're completed, um, so the Tiangong Space Station uh, will have um, roughly about one fifth the size or the mass, I should say, of the International um, Space Station. So it'll be around the size of the decommissioned Russian uh, Muir Station, which we were talking about earlier. Um, and it was based on experience from, from precursors, uh, Tiangong 1 and 2. Um, the first module was launched all the way back in 2021. <laughs> so it, uh -huh. is, it is somewhat of a new station. There are uh, there were two modules being launched in 2022, and right now we have uh, sort of this module build out happening, um, which will have sort of a core module, and then from that they're putting in the um, the laboratory module, uh, the um, Wentian laboratory, Mengtian laboratory, and then they're going to have, of course, the usual docking ports, EVA hatches. They've got a solar array, which is something that you will also see quite often in um, uh, space technology, actually. So solar panels um, owe their uh, feasibility in large part to space satellites. And, uh, um, and I'd be willing to bet that it's not going to take them 10 years to finish no. building it. Not no, like they're they're making excellent, excellent project progress. As I say, um, the initial target configuration for the end of this year, 2022, mm -hmm. is three modules, which can be expanded into six in the future. So they literally just started last year, um, and they're already um, going for three modules in this year. So uh, July which has already passed by sense of time, uh, was the Wenqian Everything. module, which is one of the lab modules. Um, and the first module that went up was the core module, of course. And then October of this year, uh, the Mengtian module will go on. And uh, the Mengtian module was the sort of the other side across from, uh, so they're both two laboratory modules, uh, which is really excellent. So this is happening very, very quickly. Um, with really excellent results. And I, I would say as well, they are also going to have a substantially better interior situation than the old uh, the old mirror did. <laughs> better CO2 scrubbers perhaps. Yes, that would probably be I ideal. Um, so that once they have all three modules, that is actually a completed uh, space station. And the astronauts, the two astronauts who went on a spacewalk 
Saturday, um, which is two days ago, <laughs> again, time and space, uh, they basically installed pumps, a handle to open the hatch door. Uh, they put in uh, a bunch of different features. And it is interesting to note that in, um, in terms of space exploration, one of the reasons why uh, China is building its own space station is it was actually excluded by the US from the International Space Station. And the reasoning behind this was stated as uh, because China's military runs their space uh, program. So in a way we have kind of made our own space race by by excluding them. Um, and they are now building their own space station and they are also planning to build their own moon base. They've done a lot of moon exploration. Apparently they discovered some really interesting new crystals. Uh, but it's, um, it is interesting that we now have this sort of political situation in addition to um, uh, uh, the uptake in in space missions all around. So this spacewalk, I it seems like an amazing success, and uh, the the space station does seem like a um, uh, like it's working very well from everything I've seen. Uh, this is in doing this, um, China actually has become sort of the third nation to actually send a person into space into space themselves. So rather than going with um, the US or the Soviet Union, they now have their own space station and their own um, their own program. And China has, of course, sent rovers to the, to the moon and Mars. It's also done a lunar sample return, which, um, which is worth remembering. So their program is really, really interesting and really stepping up. And so even though this is not um, history yet, I think it will be. By next year, I'm sure. This By is, uh, you know, and our, la our our last story, which we'll get into soon, is only a year old as well. So, you know, we 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 are living through history. Um, it's funny to talk about it as a space race, you know. Like you, the, I think there's a lot of thought about, oh well, and a nation other than the United States, a nation other than Russia, a nation is is going into space. You know, it's a superpower. It's uh, we there's a race involved. Like, I mean, what are we racing for? We're us in the in the astronomy community in the scientific community we look at this as a hey there's more people doing space activities this is generally a good thing right provided you know that they're they're doing this and and taking the research taking the samples sharing the data sharing what they're getting out of it um you know i think it's it's much less of a race and much more of a hey this is our we're pushing the limits of our technology to learn more about our environment. And so I, I really, personally, I hope it doesn't, isn't treated as this, as this big, oh my gosh, it's the next space race, it's the political thing, or, you know, SpaceX and the private industry versus the government is the next, is the next space race. Can it just be, let's all go to space and share the data and, and for the betterment of humanity? I, I would agree to this wholeheartedly. And I, and I think this is one thing that you will find around the world when you talk to, you know, uh, the scientific community, you hear this sentiment over and over again. Uh, when I talk to colleagues in, in China or in India or anywhere else on Earth, it's all about the exploration and um, learning new things. But unfortunately, we do live in a um, uh, countries. <laughs> that have governments and there was of course the anti-satellite tests yeah. um that put up debris clouds and um uh it does get unfortunately political sometimes but i for one echo your sentiments wholeheartedly i i embrace their success and i am i i would be happy to share my data if anyone wanted to send me into space <laughs> so or, well, there or you go. We can, well, that's there you go. We'll send you and the telescope. That's perfect. I like it. We'll be a joint mission, and uh, and that and that's great because our next story is going to talk about uh, some amateur astronauts, as if you or I went up into space. But uh, before we get to that, we're just going to do a quick check in because you, if you're just joining us, you're listening to York Universe. We're broadcasting live from the Alan I Carswell Observatory here at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. We've already seen the wild duck cluster live this evening. I'm excited to see what's next. So go check out observatory.info.yorku.ca 
for some of those images, for some chat, ask some questions, uh, or follow us on Twitter, at York U Observatory. Tonight, it's myself, Ryan, and Elena talking a lot about space flight this evening and astronauts and cosmonauts and taikonauts, all those different nations up in space. We're going to do one more uh, astronaut story. And this is about the, it's only a year old, so it's it's newer history, but it's the launch of the Inspiration4. Uh, and that was, that was, the launch wasn't a year ago, it was the splashdown of the SpaceX Dragon capsule that took four uh, quote-unquote amateur astronauts uh, into space, into orbit. This was the first human space flight to orbit the Earth with only private citizens on board, which is kind of an exciting thing for all of us who are interested in space tourism, thinking that you know, you and I can can buy a ticket and go up into space and orbit the Earth a few times. That's a big step toward that. Now, this specific trip, the inspiration um, was to promote and raise money for the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And so the crew and the trip, they intended to raise, you know, about a hundred million dollars um, to expand childhood cancer research. So just a, a great, a great thing. So uh, the, the crew, the four um, astronauts were chosen, started off with uh, some entrepreneurs, Jared Isaacman, Simon Proctor, uh, a physician assistant and a survivor of bone cancer, somebody who works at St. Jude's, Haley Arcano, and uh, a winner of a raffle for a donation. So you could donate between, I think it was $100,000 and $10,000 and be entered in a raffle to win the last seat on Inspiration, Inspiration 4. Unfortunately, the person who won the last seat uh, was over the weight limit. And so he decided to let his friend, uh, Chris Samborski, who's a U.S. Air Force veteran, um, go on the flight. So all four of them, they were ready to go on their first flight. They they received commercial training on how to be an astronaut by SpaceX, right? So, you know, the important things that you need to know when being an astronaut. Uh, or, learn how orbital mechanics work. Learn how to expect to operate and live and and. Uh, carry on your, your daily functions in an environment where there's microgravity. Uh, stress testing, right? There's a, you're pushing a lot of G-forces and, and a lot of uh, dangerous um, events are happening on a space flight. Emergency preparedness and safety training and first aid and simulations of the mission. All this stuff that they had to be taught. So it's something to say that although they're amateur astronauts, they still had to do a lot of training and, and probably uh, a quite a bit more than, than most of us would think. Um, but it was interesting. So they, they raised tons of money, um, including uh, Jared, Isa Jared Isaacman, one of the uh, four astronauts who went up. He and his wife personally donated over $125 million to the hospital. And uh, ultimately, they raised the total given to uh, St. Jude's Hospital more than $243 million, which was way more than their initial target. But here was the, and, and so that's all really fantastic. Inspiration for Splashdown uh, and the Dragon Capsule from SpaceX uh, today, one year ago. Can't believe it was a year already. But it was really interesting that um, a few days later, September 25th, 2021, there was a news report that an alarm had sounded during the mission. Right? So you've got these four amateur astronauts in space, and there's an alarm sounding. Something, something terrible happened. Well, don't worry. It was found to be associated with a malfunction of their toilet. A little, a little, <laughs> oh. bit, a little bit frustrating, but not devastating to the mission, uh, which was a few days long. So uh, really great um, uh, proof of concept. Great idea to get amateur astronauts up there. Great to do it for charity. Uh, and it's it's the first step in, in sending uh, private citizens to space on a regular basis. Uh, would you would you get a ticket? <laughs> if I had a hundred million dollars, I would still buy other stuff. Um, fair, but if fair. we, uh, <laughs> the price drops a little bit, maybe. Yeah, if I had a hundred million dollars, I think I would buy, uh, I don't know, a hundred one meter telescopes. <laughs> well, um, then but, you, then yeah. you have a ten by ten uh, telescope. There you go, a giant. You have exactly. a giant dish, right, with uh, adaptive optics and everything. You're set. Um, but yeah, it is interesting, of course, you know, um, the one thing they do have a problem with is toilets. So I always think about the old uh, sci-fi um, Star Trek show where they notoriously did not put um, enough toilets on their spaceship designs. 
<laughs> which is a uh, sci-fi um i don't know sci-fi and uh real science crossover um so hopefully there are uh, no toilet related problems were had because you don't want that going uh weightless but this was as you say really interesting and it, but that is one of the things we were all looking at is like hey you know this was space tourists and you know i might not pass astronaut training but i can be a tourist and if the price did drop enough you do get the impression that it is opened up and and everyone just for a moment had the idea hey you know maybe i could go into space and of course this was really really the start of um a, a boom i suppose in space tourism there was a bunch of different uh you know um space tourist oriented launches with uh, Virgin Galactic yeah. and Blue, um, Origin. Blue Origin, of course. And there's now been Firefly um, trying to get up oh. and, and uh, all kinds of new new companies, new techniques. And who knows, maybe the price will get low enough to where... I still, I still can't wrap my head around having to wear a seatbelt on the toilet, okay? I just can't. Maybe... <laughs> You I know, think the, the, the seatbelt would be the least of your problems, but yeah. That's it. There you go. There you go. So, you know, if the price drops a little bit, maybe I'll consider it. But $100 million and I have to wear a seatbelt to go to the bathroom, I'll pass. Wait until, <laughs> wait until they get that rotating space station up. Uh, you you'll go. have at least partial gravity. Perfect. Um, so, you know, we are all waiting for that one, of course, but uh, that might be a little bit farther off. I would have to say not the, the current space station, the Lunar Gateway and the Chinese uh, space station. None of them are rotating. So you will be weightless. <laughs> there you go. Do you, um, is there any other news from the OPV? Do we have any news? Yes, I was going to tell you, uh, we actually, while we were chatting, we missed, we came, we saw and uh, um, passed a uh, Saturn. So Saturn, the planet Saturn was up. Um, that would be a very, very long space flight. But the moons, uh, let's see, Enceladus, Dione, Titan, Tethys, and Rhea were all visible. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, in the field of view. So if you do want to see that, it is live on YouTube. Uh, you'll have to go back in the video a little bit because they have moved on. Uh, I think they're trying to find the next object um, or maybe a bit of cloud has moved over. But those live Saturn images were coming through um, just a few moments ago. So it is very, very exciting. Um, Saturn would be, it is worth mentioning, quite a bit more difficult to get to than um, the moon. <laughs> yep. But, it, of course, it does have a lot of really, really interesting, um, really, really interesting stuff once you get there. Of course, the, uh, I think the moons of Saturn are something we might talk about later if we have time. I will just say that I do want to give everyone a little reminder that this Wednesday we will be trying another live imaging with our Teletube episode also over on YouTube at 7.30 p.m. And I'd like to give a little shout out for the upcoming October 1st. So you might not know this, but there is a big event happening in Toronto called Nuit Blanche, uh, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, uh, on October 1st from sunset to sunrise all night long, various places around Toronto are opening up uh, for events. So of course, having a telescope, we are also going to try to open up on October 1st uh, for a bit of uh, rotating tours through the observatory and the atrium location out on the roof of the Arboretum parking garage. There is also running at the same time, if you can handle the excitement, the Stars Over Killarney event. We at the Allen I. Carswell Observatory have the Astronomer in Residence program happening right now all summer uh, through October 9th with Killarney Provincial Park, a short-ish, uh, five and a half hour drive away from Toronto. And our Astronomer in Residence is going to be sending out uh, pictures, streams, and blog posts from the Stars of Our Killarney event, which is happening the same day as Nuit Blanche Toronto. So it is a day full of astronomy on October 1st. I highly recommend everyone to uh, either check out the YouTube stream, the website, the blog posts, or a little bit of everything, and uh, enjoy. I gotta say, if you're a, a local to Southern Ontario, or even you know just close enough that you can make the trip, 
Nuit Blanche is amazing. It is a, a fusion of art and and science and media and activities, and it's all night. It's a great excuse to stay up with your friends, and uh, the weather's still not super chilly, just to go out and and take in some culture. Uh, I, I did it for years and years and years and years when I lived uh, deep into the city, and now I'm, a, I'm I'm going to bed a little bit earlier, so I'm I'm not as uh, as into it. But uh, it's it's an excellent thing to check out if you're a local. Please do. Absolutely, and if you're if you're out at uh, the New York University location, I believe there will be several Nuit Blanche stations around the university. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're all the way out at Killarney Provincial Park, uh, they will have a different event running on the same day. So there's really something for everyone. Well, let's hope for clear skies too then, right? Absolutely. Clear skies would be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so on to our first news item, which, uh, hey, we're doing pretty good for time. We might get to a few of these. I'm I'm really excited uh, to talk about Mars, Elena. Absolutely. So our first news item, um, again, I did cheat a little bit with one of my history items being somewhat current, but very, very recently we have had a lot of opportunity to start talking about Mars again, and not just because um, SpaceX and Artemis One have this sort of moon to Mars trajectory, but also uh, what we're finding out about Mars has evolved with all of the landers and missions going around it, uh, geologists have recently proposed that the number of ancient Martian lakes might have been really dramatically underestimated. And the more I, I have been following along with Mars since um, a long time ago, <laughs> like was that 1995? Um, 1998, I've been following along with these discoveries from from Mars, and the more we find out about Mars, the more water it seems to have had, and the more subsurface water it seems to it seems to have. So this is um, an article that recently came out on on Science uh, Science Daily, and it's um, basically a, an analysis of the Martian environment. Uh, this is um, a meta-analysis. So this is using one of my other favorite things, which is data science and big data and image processing and a bit of artificial intelligence as well. Um, they've gone through years and years of satellite data and they've looked at the evidence for lakes on Mars. And so they've proposed that their number of ancient lakes might have been a lot higher than what we thought. So right now we think that there are, um, you know, there was maybe one giant lake up north and, um, you know, maybe one or two smaller lakes. And Mars is a frozen desert today. Uh, There are a few places you can go in Hellas Basin that get uh, reasonable, (laughs) but it is very, very cold um, and water cannot survive on the surface. It does something called sublimation, where any liquid water that could come to the surface will immediately sort of turn into a gas and uh, be evaporated out through the through the atmosphere. But the more we're finding out about it, it seems that a lot of water does also sort of get pulled back into the uh, into the soil. And there's a lot of evidence for subsurface water, subsurface lakes. But this is the first paper I've seen that says actually the history of Martian lakes would have also been underestimated. Um, so this is a team of people, and it's uh, uh, these papers do tend to. Um, have very large international teams now. So this was originally published in Nature uh, Astronomy, um, and uh, it has um, a few different uh, uh, collaborations involved, which I'm probably not going to be able to get through all of it. So I'll just say uh, Joseph Mikalski and international team, which is a little bit of a cheat. Um, And they have uh, published, so they're basically in geology, 
Um, Dr. Mikowski is a associate professor in the Department of Earth Sciences, and uh, this uses as well um, some data from the first Chinese lander, uh, Zurong, on Mars, which is also May of this year. Um, so we're talking earlier about interesting things that have been done uh, internationally. China is also planning a sample return mission from Mars. How oh. cool would that be? That would be so, something. Whoever gets the first samples back is going to be really, really popular with all the astronomers. <laughs> um, it is uh, it is going to make a very, very interesting analysis. So lakes, of course, have water, and I do mean lakes of uh, water as we know it, not lakes of other liquid substances, like, for example, what occurs on Saturn's moon. But these lakes of water, if it is real water on the surface in the history of Mars, more of those means more possible sources for microbial life, more uh, photosynthesis uh, possibilities for light interacting with uh, water. Um, lakes are huge top targets for astrobiological explorations. Um, and of course, by uh, not just um, NASA's Mars rovers, but also the Chinese Mars rovers. So some lakes should be more interesting for microbial life than others. Some of the lakes would be large, long lived. So if you have a lake that lasts a longer time, that would be a good thing. Uh, if you have a hydrothermal system, you could have heat, water, and light, so conductive to the formation of simple life, we think. Um, so from this point of view, this paper is proposing that it actually makes sense to target large, ancient, environmentally diverse lakes for future exploration. Um, and there's a lot of similar environments on Earth that kind of play along with this. And uh, if you want to read more, um, this is Nature Astronomy, Geological Diversity and Microbiological Potential of Lakes on Mars. So <laughs> it does have a few long words in it, but it is really, really interesting. And it's a great sign for those of us who've kind of been following along with Mars, watching it just get more and more interesting every year. More and more, you know, more and more interesting every year and more and more alive every year. Now, I'm going to say that with a bit of a caveat because we haven't found life on Mars yet, but it, it feels like every discovery, a little bit more organic matter, a little bit of methane, you know, a little bit, a little bit extra water, some places where, hey, the temperature is a little bit warmer than we thought over here. There's, there's so the flowing saline water, right? Like there's, there's, there's just more and more and more. And, and we keep hearing from uh, curiosity and perseverance. There's, oh, absolutely. It's, it's exciting. It's really, it's it's really like, exciting. Get, get me that vacation house in Hellas Basin. <laughs> That's what, I'm convinced. <laughs> you just got to make it through the trip, right? The eight yes. months and a lot, you know. But we know it's possible. We do. To make it there, thanks, yeah. uh, uh, thanks to Valerie Polyakov. So yeah. we can do it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I love how simple you make it sound. That's wonderful. I, I really, I hope that it gets to be that simple someday. I hope that me it's too. Like, hey, let's. Hey, we're just going to go on, you know, I, I hope that uh, graduate students will get to do their research on Mars and just be like, hey, you know what, we're going to send some graduate students to go and collect some data and they can do their research project and get their master's or their PhD. On absolutely. Mars. Doesn't absolutely. that sound awesome? <laughs> All the grad <laughs> students who are listening right now are like, yeah, let's do it. OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and our, our undergrads have an even better chance. And I will say, um, uh, just as a segue, you think Mars is good. Well, don't forget about Jupiter. It is visible right now in the uh, one meter telescope over on YouTube. So if you've been following along with the live observing, um, if you've missed it, Jupiter in there right now, they're actually zooming in on the bands of Jupiter, probably going to do some moons shortly. That's beautiful. I, I have to say uh, from the past couple of years of data from Juno, uh, which is a spacecraft orbiting Jupiter right now. Just the, the imagery that's coming out of that has made Jupiter just my most recent favorite planet. I'm not going to be biased and say I like one more than another <laughs> because they're all amazing in their own right. But Ju just the, the, the depth, the um, intensity, uh, the variation, 
the the artistry of the clouds. And I know it's not art, but it, you know, nature's it, art. It's, yes, it's, it's nature's it's just, art, and it's the, I absolutely the, agree. The diversity in it is just wonderful. And if anybody hasn't seen the images from Juno of Jupiter, go and look at that, and then go and look at the OPV, and you'll understand why we need to send even even with a one meter telescope, why we need to send spacecraft to other planets. Absolutely. And if you do get a chance to watch any of the animations sped up showing the movement mm -hmm. of the cloud layers, yeah. it is wow. And um, shall I just suggest that maybe we can we can skip into item number two that has a Jupiter tie in because we've got yeah. about 10 minutes left. I think that's and a I, perfect way to finish. I mean, it's it's uh, the changing of the seasons, right? I want to hear your info about Jupiter, so I'll, I'll lead us off with this story is that, you know what, we're going, we're finally into almost into autumn, a couple more days. You know, I, here in North America, in Canada and the U.S., we, we kind of get to, hey, back to school happens in September, therefore summer is over, vacation has ended, it's fall, it's autumn, we're, you know, but the autumn doesn't really start until the, the equinox. Um, and so on Thursday, upcoming Thursday, at um, 9 04 p.m. Eastern Time on so September 22nd, uh, it'll be September 23rd at 104 uh, UCT, UTC, excuse me, will be the equinox, the first day of autumn in the northern hemisphere, the first day of spring in the southern hemisphere. Uh, just to give a little, you know, the, the usual background, equinox means equal night, but this is actually a misnomer because on that day, it, there is not an equal amount of daylight and darkness. The equinox is the date where the sun appears directly overhead at local noon on the equator. So at the moment of equinox, the northern and southern hemispheres are equally illuminated. They don't get the same amount of daylight. But the, the interesting thing is, uh, the it's not the equinox where you get the equal amount of daylight nightfall. It's actually a few days later uh, called the equal lux. And that'll be September 25th will be the equal lux, where we get an equal amount of daylight and darkness, an equal amount of time of the sun above and below the horizon. Now, why aren't they the same? I'm just going to go through this quickly. I know you want to get into Jupiter, Elena, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, this is good. This is good this for is everyone to know. It is. It, it really is, yeah. I mean, the sun is a disk, so on the equinox, part of the sun has actually risen above the horizon before the center of the sun, the pinpoint of light. So there are extra moments of light on the equinox and, and not to mention sunlight is refracted. It's bent by our atmosphere. And so the sunlight actually appears above the horizon before sunrise and after sunset. So you put these two effects together, the sun being a physical size, a disc, and the refraction of sunlight by our, by our atmosphere in the morning and in the evening, it actually makes uh, the sunlight on the equinox, uh, the daylight a little bit longer than the darkness. And so it's not until September 25th that we get to the equal lux, the equal light, the actual day with an equal amount of sunlight and darkness. And if you don't believe me, go and count it out. I believe in you. But on to, on to <laughs> Jupiter. It is, the, it is the equinox, the first day of autumn. I really do love autumn and spring and summer. Uh, winter, not so much, but anyway, on to Jupiter, <laughs> Elena, please. Yes, and it is, it is, uh, I have to say, autumn, autumn is great once the allergy season part dies down. So oh, I'm looking, <laughs> looking forward to uh, some of those trees losing their whatever it is that I'm most allergic to. Um, but yes, uh, in addition to having the equinox and in addition to um, having a waning crescent moon of about 30%, we also have a slew of planets out. Uh, our crew has actually moved on from imaging Jupiter um, to the Ring Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy, but Jupiter, if you want to see it, is very, very bright, visible to the naked eye. It rises at 7.37, it sets at um, 7.43 uh, a.m., so it's it's up all night. Talk about something, it's, a, it's almost exactly sort of 12 hours across, mm -hmm. going straight across the sky, and it is very, very, very bright. I do have to say that there is a reason for this, because as advertised uh, last week, I, I couldn't resist mentioning it, but Jupiter is aiming for its um, uh, its its opposition. So there's a reason why Jupiter is such excellent viewing. So it is 
visible the whole night tonight. Um, and as we go towards September 26th, it is going to be even better. So um, the Jupiter has its opposition or its closest approach to Earth. And this month is when we're going into the closest approach to Earth in the last 59 years. And this is because Earth and Jupiter don't orbit the sun in perfect circles. So if you can imagine sort of the planets, I always try to imagine the planets are sort of on racetracks mm -hmm. going around the sun, like those little cars that go in circles, mm -hmm. but they're not actually uh, perfect circles. <laughs> so they pass each other at slightly different distances through the year. And so the, the Earth is on the inside track, zipping around, zoom, 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 and Jupiter's outside track and earth is coming around and getting a closest approach a closest approach a closest approach so we always have a closest approach every year but this year is the closest that we've been in 59 years uh this is still uh approximately 367 million miles uh in distance from earth <laughs> and that's about the same distance it was in 1963. so we're talking about the history of astronomy i suppose i could have cheated and put this in history as well but i wanted everyone to be aware of it because you'll be seeing this beautiful bright light in the sky if it's not twinkling and it doesn't have airplane lights it's a good chance it is jupiter and it's um it's just going to get better and better as we go on so i'm just going to keep reminding everyone to go outside and look uppity uh, especially at jupiter well it's important to, to mention too opposition is when earth comes directly between the sun and jupiter and so that sunlight bounces right back off hey. jupiter comes right back to us and as as you exactly. said exactly blazingly beautiful um in the in the night sky uh, people always ask me, you know, how do I know that I'm looking at the planet? If I don't have a telescope, if I don't have binoculars, or I don't have a one meter telescope at home, I just, I always tell them, look for the bright dot that's not twinkling. Stars twinkle because they're much farther away. They're pinpoint spots of light. Planets have size. They are closer to us. They have a disc and uh, it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to uh, to twinkle in our moving atmosphere. So look for the bright dot that's that's not twinkling as much as some of the stars. It's brighter than any star in the sky and blazingly brilliantly bright. If you get a clear night in the next week, you're going to notice it. Absolutely. Fantastic. And the you will be able to see it in a little bit of a line. Um, so Jupiter mm -hmm. rises at uh, um, about two hours after Saturn. So you will be able to see Saturn as as well. Um, so Mars uh, is going to be up on the other side of the sky because um, it, it rises at about 10 p.m. But if you're up late at night, you might even see a Mars rising with a Jupiter and a Saturn. And of course, they will all be in the line of the ecliptic um, as the moon will be as well. So it's a great time for all kinds of observing. I think Uranus and Neptune are up as well if you have uh, uh, yes. binoculars your, and a telescope. Your chances of seeing them are less. <laughs> <laughs> At least with the naked eye. But, you know. Yes, with the naked eye, your chance of seeing them are less, but they are up as well. So well, so uh, Uranus rises at 9.15 and Neptune at 7. So Neptune actually is a very similar. It's going to be right next to Jupiter. If you've got a very wide field camera, you could even capture Jupiter and Neptune maybe uh, in the same area. Uh, Neptune is much, much, much dimmer. <laughs> so um, yes, it, it, you will need you will need a telescope or very, very good binoculars to see that even in uh, dark skies. Uh, it just reminds me of the Great Conjunction. Eh? That was that yes, was something. that oh, was when we put the new domes on. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. So, oh, perfect. I love it. Now, unfortunately, we are coming to a close in our show, so we're not going to get to the last two um, items that I want to talk about, but. Um, that's okay. There, we had another Mars story about producing oxygen on Mars that uh, I, I'm on, actually, I think I'm on radio next week, so I'm excited. I might move that to next week's news. And then a, a little story about Saturn on Science Daily where the rings of Saturn could be the product of some ancient missing moon. So a bit of a teaser for next week, we'll say. But unfortunately, that is our show. You've been listening to York Universe, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The hosts this evening have been Elena, who's been fantastic, 
and me, who has been equally fantastic. I'm Ryan. Uh, stay tuned. It's also Astronomy Night in Canada. Next up, Quirks and Quarks, Western Worlds, Science for the People. Check us out at York Universe. Check out the OPV for all those amazing images by the observatory team. Great work tonight, crew. And everybody have yourself a wonderful, clear sky evening. Clear Good skies. Night. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast service of astronomy.fm. This program has been released under Creative Commons license. Please contact us for details. You may find more of our AFM original programs on our website. It's really easy to find us. We are astronomy.fm. You may also find us in the iTunes radio listings near the top of the News Talk section and also as an iTunes podcast selection. We'd love to hear your comments. Please email us at radio at astronomy.fm. Thanks so much for being part of the voice of astronomy around the world and across the known universe. This is Astronomy.fm Radio. AFM.